It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Joining us, we have Tanis Newsham. Tanis has been a member of the Manitoba Medical Assistance in Dying Provincial Team since 2017. She joined the main team with over 20 years of experience as a clinical social worker. She holds a Master of Social Work degree from the University of Calgary and has worked extensively with people who are dealing with acute and or chronic medical issues and issues related to grief and loss. Our second presenter is Kelsey Goforth, Senior Program Manager at Dying with Dignity Canada and has been a staff member with the organization for close to six years. Kelsey is a graduate of Douglas College's End of Life Doula Program and is currently registered at Centennial College in the Thanat Thanatology Certification Program. She has completed a Patient Navigation Certificate from the Health Leadership and Learning Network at York University and as well as training in grief literacy. So thank you both for being here. Um, so to get us started um, with today's presentation, um, could you please share with us what motivated you to get involved in this field and what your role entails? Um, Kelsey, do you wanna get us started? Sure, thank you, Nicole, for the introduction and uh, thanks to all of you joining us this afternoon. So prior to joining the team here at Dying with Dignity Canada, I worked for an organization that um, did fundraising for a number of nonprofits and, and charities. Some were local here in Toronto, others were national um, and, and working internationally as well. And through my time at, at that organization, I found myself really gravitating towards the organizations that worked um, on health related topics and ones that dealt with human rights as well. So that and I, I also took a bioethics class in university so I learned a bit about assisted dying through that experience as well and the topic in my support for people to have the right to to have an assisted death were certainly on my on my mind for many years but it wasn't until I experienced a couple deaths of family members that really led me to reevaluate what I wanted to do and where I wanted to work and, and what I wanted um, my, my future to look like. And uh, that's when I, I made the shift and began working with Dying with Dignity Canada. Tanis, in your role with May, the MAID program in Manitoba, you have been present for more than 250 assisted deaths. Can you describe to us what happens during a MAID death? Um, what can both the patient and loved ones expect? Sure, um, thank you. And I would also like to thank both Nicole and Kelsey for inviting me to speak today and for everyone who has joined today. Um, so as Nicole indicated, I am a social worker and have been a social worker for quite some time. Um, and I entered this work after, uh, I think sort of to Kelsey's point, following the legislation uh, and in particular, Sue Rodriguez and Sven Robinson back in the 90s, and, and certainly um, have a firm belief that assisted dying should be uh, um, an available service for all who are eligible in Canada. In terms of what happens at an assisted death, um, of course, one needs to be eligible. And the role that the social worker here in Manitoba plays in those eligibility review meetings is what we call them. I, I'm going to guess that most of the participants today on the webinar are aware that in order to be approved for an assisted death, uh, a meeting needs to occur with two uh, assessors, uh, physicians or nurse practitioners. Here in Manitoba, we have only physician assessors at this time. Um, we have adopted a multi or interdisciplinary way of providing the service. So here in Manitoba, at each eligibility review meeting or assessment, uh, there's a physician, a nurse, and a social worker. And at the second eligibility review meeting, there's a different physician, a different nurse, and a different social worker. The two teams then come together to determine if one is eligible, and then if the person is approved, they're eligible. Um, my role at those eligibility review meetings, which 
uh, has changed somewhat due, the, due to the pandemic. I don't think anyone will be surprised by that. We are doing some virtual meetings now, whereas prior to March, it almost never happened, except for telehealth for people in remote locations in Manitoba. Um, but my role at those meetings is uh, to listen, to, to hear what the patient is saying. And when we're in person here in Manitoba, um, the physicians with their college have a guideline that at some point in the eligibility review meeting, the physician needs to meet privately with the patient. So when that's occurring, typically with the nurse, uh, the social worker meets privately with whoever else is gathered at those meetings. So uh, if there's a spouse, uh, kids, family members, friends, I will then meet with those um, family members to figure out uh, how they're feeling about all of this. Um, I also attend the provisions themselves. So uh, at a provision or an assisted death, we call them provisions. That's uh, maybe language that not all of you are familiar with. Um, the provision of medications, we've shortened it to provision. Uh, I also will uh, meet with whoever is gathered in a similar way that uh, the eligibility review meetings have the physician and nurse meet privately with the patient at the provision itself, um, prior to uh, proceeding, the doctor and the nurse also meet privately uh, with the patient. And during that time, the social worker, who is uh, me and we have some other social workers on the team as well, will meet with whoever is gathered at uh, the hospital or home where the provision is going to take place. And I review with uh, the family members or friends that are gathered what is going to take place. So um, I explain um, what the provision entails, the administration of medications and so on. Uh, I explain what we think the patient experiences when the medications are provided. And I also explain uh, what those who will be at the bedside or chair side, depending on where the provision takes place, uh, what they can anticipate seeing at the bedside. Um, I can go into that in a little bit more detail if that is wanted. If you guys would uh, nod to let me know if, if I should go into greater detail about that, I'm happy to do so. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, so in the agenda for an assisted death it sort of goes like this. Um, the team arrives, first of all, of course, the patient has to call and request a date. They need to be eligible first. I'll even back up a bit prior to that. Um, they need to be deemed eligible here in Manitoba. We provide both a letter and a phone call to all eligible patients. So they are aware that they're eligible. Our contact information is provided and patients are informed that they can get in touch with the team whenever they would like. Uh, we're only open certain hours, eight to four, but we have a voicemail that will be checked. And if a patient wants to pick a date, wants to choose to have assisted dying, um, one of our nurse coordinators, we have four, will reach out to the patient or family member. So patients don't have to um, be well enough to call the office themselves. If they're uh, wanting to pick a date, uh, they can have a family member, a healthcare provider, a friend call the office on their behalf to say um, uh, Jane Doe has requested uh, to call and she would like to pick a date next week. Our nurse coordinators will ensure that one of the two physicians who met the patient is available to provide on the day that the patient is wishing and then it's scheduled. Here in Manitoba, we are a provincial team, so some of our um, assisted deaths, of course, occur outside of the city of Winnipeg. Our other major site is Brandon, the two bigger cities here in Manitoba. Sometimes we actually need to organize um, travel to, to more remote areas, and if that's the case, it may take a day or two longer. Uh, when the team shows up, either to the hospital or uh, the patient's home, and I think we're about 50-50 right now in terms of where um, assisted deaths occur, 50% uh, in hospital, 50% um, in a patient's home. When we show up, we have two very discreet bags and, and we are very focused on being as discreet as possible. Uh, we introduce ourselves, we uh, say hello to the patient who has met us. We try to never have any team members who 
um, haven't previously met the patient um, at the assisted death itself. Uh, one of the things our physicians typically do will say to Jane Doe, um, hello, do you know why we're here? And that's done in the presence of everybody who's gathered. And that allows everybody who's gathered to know that, yes, this, this patient, Jane Doe, does know why we're here. And typically, Jane will say, you're here to help me die. And our physician will then say, is that what you want? The Jane will typically say, yes, I would like to proceed. And then the physician and nurse will meet privately with the patient again to reconfirm in private that they do indeed want to go ahead. And that's when I will be discussing with those gathered uh, what they're going to see, what we think Jane will feel if she chooses to go ahead and have help to die. The patients are asked multiple times on the day of if they do want to change their mind and we provide assurance that if they do want to change their mind that there's no penalty to do so. Um, if they opt not to go ahead and have the medications provided on that day, uh, we let them know that their eligibility does remain intact and we pack up and go. So if the patient wants to go ahead, um, the physician uh, fills up or, or uh, sets up the medications. That takes five or so minutes, not very long at all. And when the medications are set up, we reapproach the patient. And once again, the patient is asked, are you ready to start? Do you want this to happen? And if they do, the physician will start. So the way that we help people die is through a series of medications that are given through IVs. Um, we always have a nurse present and our nurses are absolutely top notch, fantastic at setting up IVs. If a patient has an existing accessible port or pick, we use that. Um, when the medications are given, the mechanism that brings about death is people lose consciousness and they do so very quickly. Um, we advise patients and their family members at both of those eligibility review meetings, and I do that prior to the assisted death itself, let them know that this happens pretty quick. People go from potentially talking and joking to, uh, and because some people are um, um, surprisingly upbeat when we show up, which can be quite a disconnect for some families when they see their family member um, just so very settled with this decision and ready for it to proceed. Um, so they can go from talking and, and interacting with family to unconscious in 30 to 90 seconds. That's quite typical. Uh, people then go into a very, very deep coma during which their breathing muscles stop working and shortly thereafter, uh, their heart stops and they die. What we think our patients experience when the medications are provided is uh, the absence of sensation, uh, which happens rapidly. So we often uh, will speak to, to families and patients and um, compare it to any type of anesthetic prior to surgery that they may have had. Uh, you know, we just you're asked to count back from 10, you might recall getting to eight and you really have no awareness or recollection of anything that occurred. We do anticipate that that is what our patients feel. They do not feel discomfort. They do not feel pain. They do not feel air hunger when their breathing muscles stop working. Um, they, they just drift off. We do think hearing is one of the last senses to go. So uh, I and the rest of the team always encourage uh, family members to send their loved one off with whatever well wishes they want them to hear last. Uh, lots of folks have music playing, favorite playlists. Um, we've had uh, lots of uh, provisions where there's a member of a faith community that's uh, reading um, a passage or saying a prayer. So what family members or whoever's gathered at, uh, at the assisted death itself will see at the bedside is their loved one lose consciousness. Again, it's very, very quick. Um, People, again, might go from talking to unconscious within 30 to 90 seconds. Uh, there's no loss of bladder or bowel function. There's, there's no involuntary movements. People just really, 
just like they're falling asleep. Um, after the death has occurred, when all of the medications are provided, uh, that takes eight to 10 minutes. So I think I'm gonna backtrack because I think I skipped over a part. Um, the medications themselves are a sedative, followed by uh, an anesthetic, which induces the coma. And that's followed by uh, a muscle relaxant, which ensures the breathing muscles don't work. We always remind uh, patients and family members that at this point, the patient is completely unaware and will not experience air hunger. And, uh, and then there's a flush at the very end of the medications just to make sure all the medication is delivered. The medications take 8 to 12 minutes to give, after which uh, our physician will listen for the absence of heart sounds. And when they're sure that there are no heart sounds, that's considered the time of death. Our physicians complete the death certificate. We can call the funeral home. Families can call the funeral home. It depends on, on where they're at comfort wise. Um, we pack up anything that we brought into the home and, and we head out. I call uh, patients about, or sorry, rather uh, family members about two weeks after to check in for some bereavement support and see how they're doing. But that, that's sort of how the provision experience goes. Yeah. Thanks, Tannis. Uh, that was very informative. Kelsey, in your um, experience supporting clients of Dying with Dignity Canada, do you have anything to add? Um, I think Tannis did a great job of, of going over what, what a provision looks like. One thing to just give a bit of perspective with the, the one drug that's given, a coma inducing drug um, called propofol, it's, that's a drug that's used typically in, in surgeries. So if people have had a, a surgery and have been you know, put under for a surgery, it's likely that they've had that drug used before. Um, but I found out recently that with a maid death, it's usually four to five times what's given um, during a, a surgery. So that's just to give you an idea of, of how deep a, a coma a person would be in. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to add, and this is going to depend on, on your province or territory, but in some parts of the country, uh, Ontario, for instance, uh, the coroner's office may be notified immediately after the death of, of the person through maid. Um, so in, in Ontario, as, as mentioned, the doctor or nurse practitioner will call the coroner's office immediately after to say what happened, and the coroner may want to speak to the family present as well. So that's just another thing to keep in mind. It's just a, a regulatory piece that's in place in some provinces, and of course, if somebody's going through a made experience, the, the clinician would go over that and what to expect, but just another thing to flag. That's a great point, Kelsey. And I'll just I'll mention too, here in Manitoba, I think we're somewhat unique. Um, Kelsey might actually have more particulars on this, but we have been um, given the instruction by our medical examiner to, uh, we pre-notify the medical examiner's office for all made deaths. So we don't have to do it afterwards. So it's, they're always pre-notified. And here in Manitoba, um, the manner of death is considered natural. The cause of death is the patient's underlying medical condition. So on the death certificate, which is two parts, uh, it, it will say that the person died of, of metastatic lung cancer, for instance. The manner of death is considered natural. We do have a second sheet on our uh, registration of death here in Manitoba that goes to vital stats and our physicians will hand write in to the procedure box, I believe, that medical assistance in dying was provided. For sure, yeah, and that's another thing that will will vary by province as well. So, if you have specific questions about about your province, um, you're welcome to reach out to to us through email, and we can provide uh, that information. But it is very uh, specific to to your area. Thank you both. Okay, let's move on here. So, um, what feedback have you heard from patients who have been approved for MAID? Um, are there any trends that you have observed, um, like fears, concerns, um, wishes for their final days or moments, um, anything like that that you can share with us? Yeah, um, in terms of fears or concerns, I, I think the number one 
comment I hear is related to capacity loss. Uh, people who are going through the, the process are afraid that the process is going to take a long time. There are assessments that need to be done and paperwork that need, needs to be completed. Um, so they are often worried that it will be a very onerous process and that by the time they get through it, it might be too late. Um, and then there are people who are, they've already completed the process and have done the assessments and the paperwork and they've waited and all of those parts of the law are done, but they're afraid that when it comes time to wanting to move forward with MAID, that it won't be able to happen quickly enough. So what I typically tell people is that if they've met with a MAID assessor and, and somebody who's going to be their MAID provider, or if they're working with a care coordination service that's regional or provincial or, ter or territorial, to keep them informed of any changes that they are experiencing. So if there is a change, a, de a decline that happens, anything like that, just to keep people in the loop so that they're aware of, of what's going on. Um, I've also heard, this is not related to people who have been approved for MAID, but another inquiry or question or comment that we get quite a bit here is from people who have not been approved for MAID. So there are restrictions on who is eligible and there are some changes that we, we anticipate coming quite soon, but we do get a lot of inquiries from people who um, don't qualify and are wondering if there's any hope that they will qualify in the future once the law changes. Um, in terms of final wishes for final days or, or moments, um, some people, most people want to die at home and spend their final time at home. That's something we hear quite a bit. And that's reflected in polling that's been done about where people want to die. Most people have said that they would prefer to die at home. Um, some speak to wanting specific music played or a final meal um, or a special drink or something like that at the end. Others don't. And uh, others take the opportunity to have something like a living wake. So rather than, or maybe in conjunction with a funeral that happens after they're, they're dead, they also want to have something while they're still alive. So they have the chance to celebrate their life with their, their loved ones. And uh, similar to that, some people will express a desire to start some type of le legacy project. So they might wanna write letters to be opened on special occasions that they won't be there for birthdays or graduations or things like that. Um, recording video messages, be watched later on, journaling about their life, that kind of thing. Hannes, do you have anything to add? I, I don't know, Kelsey did a great job there. I, I don't know that I have much more to add. I will say that we do have, uh, um, we were able for a little while to offer something called dignity therapy, uh, which some people may be familiar with. We are quite fortunate to have uh, Dr. Harvey Chachnov here in our uh, city, who is the pioneer of dignity therapy, uh, which is a legacy project. So we have had um, some really good feedback on those patients that we met with that were able to complete that. Given the increasing uh, interest in assisted dying and our limited resources, we have uh, looked to other um, healthcare providers in the city who are able to offer it as well, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, in terms of other, uh, this is the patient related question. Um, in terms of what some people want to do, we, we've had assisted deaths at cabins, in backyards. We've had uh, assisted deaths where patients have organized parties beforehand. Uh, I recall one where we showed up where there were, you know, the rolled sandwiches and, and uh, the patient didn't want to, to get anything started until we had an opportunity to sit down and eat. Uh, we've had a lady who had a feather boa and a tiara and they passed around champagne and I would say that we've had lots of folks who, who are just so terribly unwell that any type of ritual uh, it just it's it's not what they're interested in they, they really want us to just show up and, and provide the medications so it, it really does sort of span um, uh, from 
elaborate rituals and parties to very, very minimal, just please come, I'm, I'm, I'm done. So, and I think that uh, having the opportunity to plan one's own death does afford people the opportunity to, to give this some thought and think about how they want their, their last moments to be, which is, uh, which is unique and quite special. Thank you. Okay, so then let's um, let's talk about supporting family members. Um, have you what feedback have you heard from people supporting a loved one through MAID? Um, have you are there any trends that you've observed, Tannis? I'll let you uh, take that one first. Sure. Um, in terms of supporting uh, family members, again, we're we're, we're uh, I think we're super fortunate here in Manitoba that we have an inter disciplinary provincial team. Uh, I think we're very fortunate to have that, but we're also pretty limited in the number of resources that we have within the team. So our first go-to is always to explore what existing supports <clears throat> families may have. Um, and here in Manitoba, we have some Again, excellent clinicians uh, with the palliative care program here in the city. Uh, our cancer care uh, program here is quite robust, and there's some excellent uh, clinicians associated with that team as well. And um, one of the things that I hear consistently from, from family members or friends who have a loved one exploring MAID or who has picked a date uh, is just how surreal it is. Uh, and we do give voice to that. We name it. We, we let family members know that it, it's okay to think this is a bit weird um, or surreal given that it's relatively new and most people haven't been raised uh, to expect to be able to pick the time and date of your death. Um, now that is something that Canadians who are eligible can access, but certainly prior to 2016, that wasn't. So it is a bit surreal. And I have had feedback from people who talk about um, the clock watching or the calendar watching when a, when a uh, patient or, or a loved one has picked an actual date and how, um, difficult to some degree that can be for people as they start checking off the days, knowing that, I'll continue with Jane Doe, that, uh, that Jane has a date um, coming next Wednesday. Um, and knowing that as the days go by, it, the time with Jane is shrinking. And similarly with the clock watching, which is, you know, the maid team's gonna be here in a day or 10 hours or five hours, or they're gonna be here in two hours. And that can be quite um, a, a difficult reality to na navigate for, for family members. The flip side of that is I've also had a lot of feedback from family members who, and friends who've experienced the death of others who did sit uh, vigil at a dying family member's bedside. When the death, wasn't certain when it was going to occur and the emotional roller coaster that that can bring about. And I want to be a hundred percent clear here. Natural deaths can be absolutely as beautiful as an assisted death. Um, it, it's not an either or it's, these are two options. Some people choose to have an assisted death. Some people do not. Um, so I just want to preface my, com my uh, comments with that. Um, but I had one, one gentleman in particular say, and it was his dad in this case, um, his dad was dying and he had experienced the death uh, of another family member. And he compared his, his dad's maid death this way. He said, I knew exactly how much time I had left with him. So every day I showed up, I could give him everything I had. I didn't have to preserve any, wondering if I needed to come back tomorrow and have a little bit more of me to give. So that certainty can also provide comfort. It's surreal and it can be discombobulating. You run into someone at the grocery store and what are you doing Friday? And well, you wouldn't believe what I'm going to be doing Friday and how, you know, it, it's surreal. Um, but at the same time, the certainty about knowing how much time you have left with a loved one allows people that opportunity to make sure that everything they want said is said. So it can be comforting. Um, I do recommend that people check out the virtual hospice, Canadian virtual hospice on, on the web. It's an absolutely excellent resource and there's lots of information about end of life care. Um, 
And again, we do try to plug in uh, supports for family members uh, as best we can, given what resources we have here uh, in Manitoba. Thanks, Tannis. Kelsey, do you have um, anything to add on supporting family? Um, we hear quite a bit from family members who are feeling overwhelmed or stressed about some of the steps involved in the process. And one of those things is, is the independent witness requirement. So each person who's applying for and hoping to access MAID has to fill out a, a written form. It needs to be witnessed by two people who are independent, who aren't providing any healthcare or personal care to that person and aren't benefiting from their death in any way. So nobody named in their will, nobody who's receiving a, a gin or you know, something like that after, after the death, there can be no material benefit. So for some people, that's quite stressful to think about who that person might be. Um, we're also in a pandemic, that adds some additional stress. Um, so we do hear from people who call in a bit of a panic, not knowing who to ask and where to go from here. So we do have an independent witness program uh, many places across the country. It looks a bit different given COVID, but it is something that we're still doing uh, in many parts of, of the country. So we have been able to provide a bit of relief when it comes to that specific stress that, that the family is going through, but um, it is something that we, we hear quite a bit. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay, so continuing on, um, kind of on the trend of supporting family, uh, let's talk about supporting children. So Kelsey, I'll let you start with this question. Um, have you been present for a death where a child has also been present? And what advice do you have for talking to children about death and dying, um, including MAID? Yeah, sorry, you cut out a little bit, Nicole, but uh, what I heard there was um, any experience with children at a maid death and, and talking about children and grief and death and dying. Um, so I'm happy to address that. I, I will say that I haven't been present um, for a, a death with a, a child also present. And just to clarify that unlike Tannis, uh, she goes to many made deaths. Um, that's not a, a regular part of my, my role at Dying with Dignity Canada. It is something I've experienced, but it's not something I've not uh, been to nearly as many as, uh, as Tannis has. So um, what I can speak to is, is some of what I've learned from my thanatology and death doula studies. And uh, this is just information that academics and clinicians have have uh, documented in the literature. So I can certainly share some of that. And, and this is some, um, some of these pieces I've heard from made clinicians as well who have uh, spoken highly of, of these approaches. So one thing when speaking to children about death, whether it's made or not, is, is language and being very clear. So often we'll say things like, oh, we're you know, putting the cat to sleep or, you know, this person's just, they're just sleeping and they're going to sleep forever. And, you know, saying words like that, trying to, you know, speak more gently about what's happening. And we might think that we're protecting the child in some way, but in reality, we might be doing more harm than if we just spoke truthfully about what's happening. We can think of how children might interpret it quite literally and say, well, if grandma's sleeping and she's not waking up, what if I go to sleep and never wake up too? So if we just explain what death is, and there might be age-appropriate ways to do that, um, it often is, is better. Um, another thing is there is a lot of um, misinterpreting how children grieve, and it might look different than how adults grieve, but because adults might not be looking for those specific indicators, and because adults are often grieving as well, uh, if a loved one died, they might not notice this. They might assume that the child's just not aware of what's happening and not experiencing that grief, but they might be experiencing it through their play, you know, playing with dolls and what the dolls are talking about might be very different than what they're usually talking about or through art or drawings or things like that. So that's something to be mindful of. There's also a, another um, component of children's grief called the four C's. And a lot of these come down to reassurance. So one is, can I catch it? If I cause it, can I cure it? And who will take care of me? So can I catch it? You know, 
is dying of, of cancer? Am I going to catch the cancer from grandma and die too? No, we will reassure the child that what grandma has is not is not going to be just to, to them. Did I cause it? And this, an example of this is if a child is reflecting on, you know, last week I was acting out a lot and I was kind of being a pain and mom yelled at me a lot. And then this week she told me that she's sick and she might die. Is this my fault? And again, reassurance that that is not the case. Um, also, can I cure it? So if I act on my best behavior, if I'm really good, all of this will stop. And then the last one who will care for me. And again, this is reassuring them that if something happens or if something has happened, you know, there is going to be someone to take care of you. Um, depending on the situation and the age of the child, it might make sense to talk about um, you know, the, the documentation that can be in place to ensure that a guardian is is there if something does happen to both parents. Um, and also just speaking more generally about the support circle that the parent, the child has, aunts and uncles and family friends, and just reassuring them that they're not alone, um, regardless of what happens, there's many people in their lives. Candice, I'll let you um, speak to that as well. Have you had any experience sure. supporting children who are made? Yeah, you know what, we, we've, um, we have had a number of children at assisted deaths here in Manitoba, and I suspect it's occurred all throughout the country. I think the youngest we've had is four at the bedside for a grandparent. Um, and I, I was at one with uh, a gentleman whose nine-year-old son was present when, when he died. And to Kelsey's point, I think it's exactly correct that parents do want to protect their children. I think that that's um, what parents' job is. And that some parents do feel that by withholding information, they are protecting them, when in fact, uh, that's not the case. Um, informing kids in age-appropriate language is protecting them. And I'm sure most people have heard the phrase, nature abhors a vacuum. And when kids are not getting the information um, they make it up. So if kids see that mom is starting to change in terms of the way she looks, you can tell she's starting to lose weight. She's now, she's got a wig and mom isn't telling what's going on. The child will typically make that up. They'll, they'll figure it out on their own and how they figure that out may be based on information that's completely faulty and, and riddled with errors. So yeah, we certainly recommend that, um, it, certainly illness related that parents and grandparents do speak to kids and youth about the illness piece. In terms of made specific information to children, there are some really good resources out there. Um, I've really relied heavily on um, the Youth Grief Network. If they have uh, some need specific language that parents or grandparents can choose to use if they wanna tell kids about an assisted death. Um, Dr. Jays uh, also has some really great uh, information about assisted dying there, as does kidsgrief.ca, an excellent website. Um, and in terms of kids being present at an assisted death, I think provided the child or youth has um, age specific accurate information, it's not a traumatic thing to witness. It's sad. I don't think there's any way around um, that piece of it. Losing someone you love is sad, uh, but it's not traumatic. And we always defer to parents. It, it, you know your kid best. If you think that. Um, having them there to witness this event might cause them um, emotional distress and, and you don't think it's in their best interest, then, then don't bring them. Um, but if you think they can handle it, it's a lovely way to say goodbye to a loved one, is to be right there with them. Now, one thing that when I am explaining uh, an assisted death in the time prior to the medication starting, if there's kids present for that discussion, I always make really, really, really uh, make it really clear that the medications that we provide to help someone die are very different and in very different doses than what someone else might receive from a physician to make them better. 
if someone needs an IV, it is almost certainly to help them get better. Our IVs are for a very specific purpose. So just to make sure that for kids, it's really, really clear that if I have to have an IV sometime in the future, that is not going to bring about my death, that the, the IVs for MAID are specific to our purpose and that the medications that we use at the time to help someone die um, are specific to that purpose. So medications in a different context are to make you better and IVs in a different context are to make you better. So I think provided that that's um, shared with the child, I, I don't see that, uh, uh, it, again, it's not a traumatic thing to witness. Thanks, Tannis. Okay, so um, let's talk now about grief. So um, Tannis, I'll direct this one to you first. Do you feel that the grief um, one experiences with a maid death is the same or different than the grief one experiences um, when someone dies without maid? And if you could just maybe clarify why and what maybe some of the similarities or differences are between the two? Sure. Um, so I would say in a nutshell, I don't think they're, they're necessarily different. Uh, however, having said that, for certain people, um, if anyone's familiar with the concept of different disenfranchised grief, so that's grief that occurs in, in silence. Um, for certain uh, situations, if, uh, if a loved one died by suicide, if a loved one um, experienced uh, the death of a, of a same-sex partner but wasn't um, out, so to speak, and that relationship was sort of a, a quiet relationship and, and they've lost their, their partner but no one knew they were gay, that can be a disenfranchised type of grief. And in terms of maid, uh, for some people, I don't think it happens very often, thankfully, but for some people, their community is, is not supportive of uh, an individual's right to access an assisted death, and therefore they don't feel comfortable sharing how their loved one died. So uh, the manner of death, rather. So for those folks, sometimes there may be a flavor of, of disenfranchised grief, but by and large, the issues grieving a maid death are really no different than grieving a non-assisted death. Um, the shock, the sadness, uh, the, the bargaining, um, um, the, the acceptance with time, you know, it, it really is uh, similar. We were, had the really good fortune to offer a twice yearly maid support group uh, here in, in Winnipeg for people who had lost a loved one uh, through the assisted dying team. And really by and large, nothing came out of that group that you would not expect to come out of any bereavement group. The issues were very, very similar, except for the, the one or two who really felt they had to keep it secret from, from other people, from colleagues, from uh, people in their community. That can add a little bit of a different flavor. Um, I think it's, it's uh, lessening though that, that people have reluctance to, to disclose. So. Um, in a nutshell, I don't think it's all that different, except for that one population that, that may be quite reluctant to share the manner of death. Yeah. And Kelsey, do you have anything to add um, about grief and, uh, and maid and, and death? Um, not, not too much. I think tennis um, covered everything very well. I think just a, a general thing to keep in mind with grief is that it does look different for everyone. And what normal in quotes looks like looks different for everyone as well. So of course there can be situations where a person is going through complicated grief of, of some kind and they may need some additional support to get through that. But as a society, I think we tend to want to measure things and then try to decide if it's normal or, or not normal. Um, so an example is, you know, if so-and-so's partner died a year ago, but they're still not ready to date somebody else, they must not be doing very well with their grief. This must be a real problem, but that, that must, may, sorry, may not be the case, but we, we tend to try to look at things in, in an either or sort of way. Um, that's just something to keep in mind more generally about, about grief. 
Great, thanks. Okay, so um, just before we move into our audience questions, I'm just gonna ask if either of you have any recommendations. Um, so are there any books, films, documentaries um, that you would recommend for people wanting to become more death literate? Kelsey, I'll let you start with that one. Sure, um, I have a few I can think of. In terms of documentary, um, How to Die in Oregon, is, is a good one. So a couple things to keep in mind, it is US based, of course. Um, so a lot of what's described in it when it comes to assisted deaths, it's, it's specific to that area. Um, the deaths in Oregon are done mainly through uh, people consuming something orally. That's not the case in, in Canada. That's permitted, of course. It's one of the two options people have, but most people do the, the IV route here in Canada and eligibility criteria looks different in, in U.S. states as well. So keeping those things in mind, um, I think that if you just want to get an idea of thoughts and experiences of people who are considering um, an assisted death, I, I think this is a, a good film to watch. And I watched it prior to joining the team at Dying with Dignity Canada, and it was quite powerful um, and had quite an impact on me. A couple books the Needs of the Dying by David Kessler is quite good. That's a book. Uh, David Kessler, he worked closely with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who, whose name many of you probably recognize as um, she's quite well known for her work on uh, death and dying and grief. Um, so David Kessler's book is, is quite good. Um, and then if you're looking for something that's more of a practical guide to different considerations at end of life, there's one called The Art of Dying Well by Katie Butler. And again, she's she's based in the US, so you have to take some of it um, and, and adapt it to the Canadian context. But a lot of the general principles about what to consider and what to plan and, and just how to um, approach any end of life discussions is, is quite good. Great, thanks, Tannis. Do you have any um, recommendations that you can share with everyone watching? Yeah, the only thing I can add to that great list that Kelsey just provided would be the Canadian Virtual Hospice website. There's just so much information on there. I think it's fantastic. So that's, that would be my only addition. Okay, great. So um, now let's uh, have a look at some of, we've had quite a number of questions come in. So, um, I'm going to start with one here that we got asked quite a few times and Kelsey, I'll direct it at you. Um, are organ and body donation possible um, with a made death? Um, yes. So both are possible and both have happened, but of course every situation is unique. So you have to keep um, individual circumstances in mind. Um, I'm not an organ donation specialist of any kind, but um, I'll speak to some of my understanding of, of how that works. So organs need a blood supply constantly for them to work. And once that blood flow stops, once the person dies, the organ will become unviable quite, quite quickly. So for somebody to have a made death and also donate their organs, they would have to be close to an operating room that's capable of, of going in and, and retrieving those organs. Um, also, if a person's having made and is hoping to donate organs afterwards, um, they'll likely have to do some things ahead of time like blood tests or potentially x-rays um, as well. So that's another consideration. Um, with tissues, they don't need the same level of constant blood flow that organs do. So it may be possible for somebody to die elsewhere, like at home, and still be able to donate things like uh, corneas, bones, tissues, uh, for example. I, I think if you wanted more specific information though, it would be best to go to the group that's responsible for organ donation in your community. So Trillium Gift of Life in Ontario, um, AHS in Alberta. If you just Google, you should find whatever the, the group is in your province. Um, I do have experience with um, body donation to a medical school prior, or, sorry, following a maid death. Um, again, if this is something that uh, if you wanted to know more about, getting in touch with the local medical school in your community would have the most accurate information. Uh, there are limits as to whose body they will accept. Um, things like height and weight are considered. There's restrictions on that. 
um, time since the person died, um, certain medical conditions that the person might have, and these requirements might look different from medical school to medical school. So that's why we should uh, just reach out to who is uh, whoever is local. Um, and for people who are interested in, in looking into that, they may ask questions ahead of time. If, if somebody you know, hasn't made death scheduled and is interested in doing this, they might ask some questions to determine if the body might be accepted. But it's important to know that they won't know for sure until they actually see the body after the person has has died. So my understanding is that there isn't ever a guarantee that a body will be accepted, even if you, you know, filled out paperwork and spoken to them, um, there still could be things that happen that could, could make the body um, not, not fit for being accepted. Thanks, Kelsey. Tanis, I, I have so many other questions here. I don't know if you just wanted a second to, to speak to organ and body donation as well, though. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, we have had, I, I believe, three uh, organ donations uh, after a made death here in Manitoba. Um, so they have occurred. I think we had the second in the country, actually. Um, and the person who donated organs in that situation uh, did a whole documentary and I think it was on CBC and a more recent um, gentleman who had an assisted death actually had to be flown to Winnipeg and uh, the selflessness of that act of leaving his home community uh, with the express uh, goal of being able to donate his organs was simply remarkable. So I just want to say that too. It doesn't happen super often, uh, but when it does, I'm always just blown away by people's selflessness to even consider that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, okay, so um, let me move on here with another question. And Tanis, I'll direct this one to you. So um, how should families handle it when um, clo other close family members disagree with MAID or their decision to access MAID? It's a great question with no easy answer. So families um, often don't agree on things and this is no exception. Uh, what I've actually been quite surprised with, however, in doing this work over the last three years is how often it doesn't happen that, that there's a family member who's strongly opposed. What I have found is that people who approach our team with an interest in assisted dying, um, it tends to be consistent with how they've been wired throughout their whole life. So they like to be captains of their own ship. They like to be in control. They're super at planning and they want their death planned in a way that's consistent with how they like to plan everything. So what often happens is other family members, when I, because we often ask them is, are you surprised that they've reached out to our team? Usually we hear, oh gosh, no. No, not at all, because this is how they are. They're like this. But um, families being families, oftentimes, um, not oftentimes, sometimes, uh, there is disagreement. And there's a couple of ways to approach that. One is to try to open up that conversation, even with a facilitated conversation with a clinician myself, if, um, if that's wanted, or any other support system. It doesn't even, a neutral party of any kind, just to open up that conversation and figure out where's the disconnect. Is it a value disconnect? Is it, I just don't want you to die? It's not how you die, I just don't want you to die. Um, that, that is uh, not unusual. Um, and at the end of the day, the reality is that patients are able to make this decision independent of the wishes of other family members. So it's a red flag for us. If during our meetings, we hear that uh, a close family member is very opposed, um, that's a red flag and we will explore that in greater detail with uh, hopefully further conversations. Often we can, oftentimes we can mitigate that if, uh, all parties are in agreement with having a conversation, but sometimes at the end of the day, we can't resolve the conflict. And something that I've learned to appreciate is that people can support their dying loved one and still be opposed to MAID. It, 
they're not mutually exclusive. They can both occur at the same time. So people can come to the eligibility review meetings or assessments. They can come to the assisted death. They can be at the bedside. They can hold their loved one's hand. And they may not agree with it. And that's okay. So that, that's kind of how I would answer that question. Um, again, it doesn't actually happen very often, uh, but when it does, oftentimes we can move, the, the patient themselves can move that conversation into a place that there's greater understanding. And one thing I'll just quickly add is, in our experience, if family members are present for those meetings, for the review meetings, and they are able to hear their loved ones share in their own words why they're interested in need and what the sources of their suffering are, oftentimes that's a real eye-opener for family members who may not have appreciated just how impactful having this diagnosis or this disease progression has been on their loved one. And sometimes that in and of itself um, softens their opposition to proceeding with an assisted death. Thanks, Tannis. Okay, so just in the essence of time, um, I see everybody's questions coming in and we're doing our best to answer some of them on the back end. Um, can't answer them all live. So um, I have one final question um, for our panelists here and any other questions that are outstanding, please email them to us at info at dyingwithdignity.ca and we will um, get back to you um, there. So, um, Final question, um, looking back on your experiences, um, what is the most important lesson you have learned in your journey with dying? Um, Kelsey, I'll, I'll give that to you if you want to go or if you want to pass it to Tannis, whichever. I, I can start, sure, okay. and then Tannis can, uh, can share her answer. Um, I think one thing that I've learned is, is patients' rights related. Um, I think a lot of people are, they might go to their doctor, nurse practitioner, or specialist, or you know, any type of medical appointment, and feel as though maybe they can't ask all the questions that they want to ask, or maybe um, you know, they they just feel as though they have to um, say yes to whatever is being proposed. But as a patient, as an individual, people have the right to ask questions. They have the right to ask for a second opinion if that's what they want. Um, so I, I think just being at Dying with Dignity for the last number of years and speaking with individuals who are often, you know, going through end of life experiences, but some aren't, some are, are not at that point yet, but they're just planning for, for the future. Um, that really has resonated with me and it's something that has had an impact on, on my life as well. I'm, healthy, I, I hope, and not, not you know, facing any um, serious health issues, but all of these learnings are, have been so helpful for me, and uh, as I'm, you know, supporting older family members and, and thinking about what I want for my own um, health care, so I think that's something that regardless of where you're at in your life or where you're at with any, any medical conditions that you have, it's something that we can all Keep in mind that as patients, we have rights. Um, we have them listed on our website if you want to see them. And those are something to just keep in the back of your mind when you're having any interaction with healthcare providers. Thanks, and Tannis, I'll, um, I'll give you the last word then on and sharing your experience. Okay, thank you. I, I, I won't take it up anyone's time. I know we're, I think we're just even over. Um, uh, you know, I guess my take home in, uh, in terms of my experiences for the last three years with being present for assisted dying is, is the profound beauty that can occur between patients and family members at the end of life. I, I think that uh, many of us, probably myself included, have been raised to be quite fearful of death. And certainly talk of death is, is not something that, was, uh, that ever occurred at my kitchen table growing up. Um, but that it's okay to, to change that narrative and to be more comfortable about talking about dying and to not be quite so fearful about, uh, about our own deaths or the deaths of loved ones. Um, it, it's one of those certainties about being a human that at some point we are all going to die and that uh, death doesn't have to be something to be feared. I, I guess that would, that would be what I'd say. 
That's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, okay. So yeah, we are a few minutes over, but um, I think everybody enjoyed today's session and thank you both for this conversation. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else did as well. Um, and to all our attendees, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and like I said earlier, um, if you have any outstanding questions, please email us at info at dyingwithdignity.ca. And thank you all for attending today. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.